debate for you this evening. The debate title will be Are the Sources of the Resurrection Reliable? Uh, the format will be 20 minute opening statement, 10 minute rebuttal, five minutes for the concluding statements. The two participants contending tonight will be Aki Lonk, who will be representing the Muslim side, and Pastor Jason Burns, representing the Christian side. Pastor Jason Burns, just let us know when you're ready, and your time will start beginning. Uh, your time will begin as soon as you address the mic, and it will be for 20 minutes. Hi folks, it's good to be with you, and thank you so much, uh, Aquil, to debate me, and Yaya Snow, and others, uh, Ijaz, for inviting me. I uh, really appreciate that. I'd like to pray before I start. Dear Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love. And Father, I pray that for all of us today, we would know your love. And so, Lord, I pray that you be in this for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Please drop in your school bag. Amen. I'd like to start uh, reading uh, Galatians chapter 1. It says, Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ, and God the Father who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia, grace be unto you, peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and will pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. And we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which you have received, let him be accursed. And um, if Christianity is false, then I'm going to become a Muslim. Uh, if, Islam is false, if Islam is false, then you need to become a Christian. And the key for the Christian is this issue of the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to start my presentation on three points. I want to talk about presuppositions, our bias, sources, and if we get time, a little bit of evidence for the resurrection. So I want to just talk about uh, presuppositions. Uh, one of the things with atheist Christians and Muslims is we don't talk a lot about our presuppositions. And um, when we look at the history of Jesus and who our Lord Jesus is, we come with certain bias. The atheist looks at the material with bias, the Christian looks at the material with bias, and the Muslim does. For example, Ernest Rayman, 1823 uh, to 92, said Jesus was a romantic visionary. H.G. Holzman, 1832-1910, Jesus was the teacher of the timeless ethical truths. John Ice Wise, 1863-1914, to 1914, Jesus was an eschatological teacher eschatological teacher figure who should be fitted into first century Judaism. Albert Schweitzer, 1875-1965, Jesus was a failed prophet but a towering personality. Rudolf Bultmann, 1884-1976, he saw Jesus as a preacher of timeless truth and was influenced by his existential philosophy. Uh, we are British uh, atheists like Christopher Hitchens uh, who didn't believe in miracles so he couldn't see that Jesus uh, could have risen from the dead. We have Michael Onfray, French philosopher, who, who uh, didn't even think Jesus existed, but it was his atheist philosophy that was influencing. Dominic Crossan said presuppositions are important. So I want to just say that as Christians and Muslims, we come with bias. I come with bias, and you come with bias as Muslims. Uh, Surah 15, verse 9 to 43 to 3 to 4 says that uh, the the Quran is uh, inerrant, and in 2 Timothy 3.16, it says the Bible is the word of God inspired. So we've got to look at the atheist presupposition, the Muslim presupposition, and the Christian presupposition. The atheist presupposition is miracles can't happen. They can't say that because at the quantum level, they don't know whether something's going to break into history or not. So the atheist presupposition is done. Then you've got to come to the Muslim presupposition. The Muslim presupposition, if we look at Surah 2 verse 1, it says about the Quran, this book, there is no doubt in it. It is a guide to those who are mindful of God. So for the Muslim, the Quran is the presupposition that they're using to look at history. We see that in Surah 4 
uh, verse 157, they declared, we are put to death, the Messiah, Jesus son of Mary, the Messiah of God. They did not kill him, nor did they crucify him. So the Muslim is looking at the resurrection and death of Christ, saying that Christ did not die, that it seemed as if he died, but he did not die. And that's the presupposition of the Muslim. And um, I just have a few issues with this presupposition of the Muslims. In uh, Sari Bukhari, volume 6, um, book 61, 556, it says that Muhammad forgot a verse. That's just one issue. There are many uh, surahs, uh, many um, hadiths that show that the Quranic sources are not reliable. How can it be the true word of God if even the prophet has forgot? And then I have Surah 3337, which talks about Muhammad, uh, that the Quran says that uh, we're not to adopt anymore. And it seems strange that Muhammad married his adopted son's wife. And it seems as if the Quran is just a production to suit Muhammad's desires. So I can't take the, the Quranic presupposition seriously. And we could go into contradictions in the Quran. It says, um, it says, uh, uh, it says, uh, was man created from blood, clay, or dust, or nothing? Uh, created man out of mere clot of congealed blood. Surah 96, verse 2. We created man from a sounding clay, from mud molded into shape. Surah 15, 26. Uh, the similitude of Jesus before Allah is that of Adam. He created him from dust and said to him, be, and he was. Surah 3, 59. Uh, but does not man call to mind that we created him before out of nothing? Surah 19, 63. Um, see also Surah 50 to 35. He has created man from a sperm drop, and behold, this same man becomes an open dispute to Surah 6, 4. So there seems to be contradictions within the Quran. I'm, I'm willing to be corrected on that. I'm not a, a, an Arabic scholar. Now, for me, I believe the Bible gives us history. It talks about uh, in uh, Luke chapter 1 that uh, Luke gathered eyewitnesses. So history for the Christian is a good presupposition. We want to know what history is all about. Sorry about this. So we've dealt with presuppositions. Now I'd like to just look at methodology. And there's so much material that we need to look at. I'm using Mike Lacona's methodology, explanatory scope. This means we look at the quantity of facts. Explanatory power, this is the quality of facts. Plausibility, whether hypothesis concern, conforms to the background knowledge. Uh, let's ad hoc, does our information just come up with ad hoc ideas or is it rooted in proper historical information? Next, we cannot just build a case of the sources, whether the sources are accurate, unless we're building on uh, modern scholarship. Modern scholarship gets many things wrong, but there are certain facts that historians believe today. E.P. Saunders, in his book, Judaism, Jesus and Judaism, in Philadelphia Fortress Press, names a number of facts. Number one, Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. Number two, Jesus was a Galilean uh, and preached uh, and did healings. Number uh, three, that he had 12 disciples. Number four, he did his work for Israel. Number five, he was controversial at the temple. Number six, he was crucified outside Jerusalem. Uh, and uh, number seven is uh, disciple, Jesus' disciples were persecuted. We're going to look at, so I'm building, you can't say, you can't argue against the Christian faith unless you're willing to engage with modern scholarship of E.P. E. Sanders and many others that said there are these basic facts. they call called bedrock facts. And I think the Muslim community, the Muslim scholarly world, has not adequately dealt with this properly yet. And it needs to be dealt with. Um, so the Gospels, are these good sources? Tatian, the Assyrian, a Christian theologian, theologian lived about 120, 118. He used uh, the, the Gospels, showing you that the Gospels were before 180 AD. 150 AD, just in March, the first apology, quotes the Gospel of John. Eusebius, the historian, says that Papias uh, of Herolapolis talks about the writings of Matthew and Mark when Papias wrote about five volumes. That puts uh, the Gospel of uh, Matthew and Mark into the first century. Uh, Polycarp, a disciple of John, in his letter, Philippian Church, he quotes from the Gospels and other New Testament books. 100 AD. The Didache was a teaching text and used widely by the church. The writer quotes for, uh, from Matthew on, on the Lord's Prayer. In 95, that was 95 AD. Clement quotes Matthew in uh, 1 Clement 13, 1, 2. All this evidence shows that the Gospels are first century documents. Notice that the Quran is 600 years after the Gospels. No eyewitness material, 
no real historical information. Yeah, and what we've done here by looking at these sources, uh, the early church fathers and writings and the gospels come within the first century. Some books you could read, John Arthur Thomas Robinson, a theological ribble, uh, liberal, John W. Wayne, professor of New Testament Greek and biblical scholar, uh, Gerger uh, Gerhardsen, Swedish professor at Lund University, Michael J. Jaus, a French biblical scholar, Jean Carmack, a French scholar, Philip Rowland, a French scholar, Carsten Peter Thie, German papyriologist. You can read all these, and also you can read a popular article, The Early Eyewitness of Jesus by J. Warner Wallace. So we've established the Gospels are in the first century. Uh, we read uh, this in Ignatius' letter. Jesus Christ was of the stock of David. He was from Mary. He was truly born, ate and drank, was truly persecuted under Pontius Pilate, was truly crucified and died, and also was truly raised from the dead. His father raising him. Ignatius based his comments on the Gospels. He knows at least three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and uses them often in his seven letters, Ignatian's letters to the Trillians, 9-4, chapter 9-4, uh, J.N.D. Kelly, Early Christian Creed Slogan. Uh, also uh, noted uh, the Gospel Truth by Paul Barnett, IBP 2012. Ignatius wrote about 110 AD, so puts the Gospels as first century historical source material. The next, the important thing is to note the Gospels are accurate historical documents. This is from Bible.org. Uh, in Bethesda, in John 1.4.4, this text tells us Andrew and Peter came from that city, that they were fishermen, and archaeologists have discovered a plethora of fishing implements in, the, in a house in Bethesda, therefore confirming the Gospel of John as being historically accurate. Cana, John chapter 2, verse 1 and 11, archaeologists who think that Kerbet Cana is the place where Jesus did the miracle of turning water into wine, found storage facilities of water pots. Uh, M.T. Gerzim, uh, sorry, Mount Gerzim. John comments on this mountain, John 4, 19, 23. We know the Samaritans worshipped on this mountain, and it's clear that John's text, he alludes to this. We also have texts of the Samaritans from the 4th century AD, which have within the earlier tradition of Messiah expectation. This can be seen in the Samaritan woman's reaction to Jesus. Samaritan text, let the restorer come safely and sacrifice a true offering. The restorer will come in peace and reveal the truth and will purify the world. Jesus replied to the Samaritan woman, messianic question, I who speak to you and me, uh, John chapter 4, 25, 26. This is basically rooted the Gospel of John in first century uh, historical context. The pool of Bethesda, John describes a pool called Bethesda in John 5, 2 in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate. Uh, von Walt writes, the discovery of the pool proves beyond a doubt that the description of this pool was not the creation of the evangelist, but reflected accurate and detailed knowledge of Jerusalem. Tiberius, John is the only one to identify the Sea of Galilee as also the Sea of Tiberius, John 6, verse 1, 21, 1. Herod Antipas, Tetrarch of Galilee and Perea, 4 BC to 39, moved the capital from Sephora's to Tiberius in about AD 24. So he reflects the change in political times. That's in the Gospel of John. And now, number six, Pilate's judgment seat. In John 19, 13, Pontius Pilate brought Jesus to the judgment seat. And this has been identified near the Hedorian Palace, Hedorian, Herodonian Palace. Now let's look at the uh, reliability of the synoptic Gospels. We looked at the Gospel of John. The inscription about Pontius Pilate. Pilate is mentioned in all four Gospels an inscription of Caesarea uh, Martima was found with his name on its prefect of Judea, which is the southern region that encompassed Jerusalem. Number two, the boy Jesus in the temple in Luke 24, uh, Luke chapter 2, verse 41. Fifty, the discovery of a stairway south of the southern wall in the Temple Mount makes it clear that it was here that the young Jesus amazed the rabbis by his knowledge. This was the place the rabbis came to discuss the matters of the law. So Luke knows intricately. The, uh, the architecture of uh, the temple in Jerusalem. A wine press, stone walled terraces, and three towers. I'll stop there. I could go on and on about the historical detail of um, the Gospels. Uh, you can read The Historical Reliability of the Gospels by Craig Blomborg, 2007. The New Testament documents are the reliable FF Bruce uh, as a, a way of reading into these topics. Now let's look at the Gnostic Gospels. The Gnostic Gospels, the, the word comes from ancient Greek word for knowledge. A Gnostic is someone who knows a knower. What does he know? It, is, it was secret teaching. 
When you read the Gnostic Gospels, the Hermani literature, the Nag Hammani literature, they are all about secret knowledge. In contrast, you find the, the Gnostic texts do not anchor Jesus in historical time. For example, Pilate is not mentioned uh, very. Pilate is mentioned very little. Galilee comes only once in a Gnostic text. As for biblical gospel, Pilate appears about 60 times. Galilee is mentioned almost uh, six, uh, 60 times. Nagamani Gnostic text, Jerusalem is only found 16 times, and the comments lack historical uh, reality. The biblical gospel mentioned Jerusalem 70 times and know the city intimately. Matthew 21, 12, 6, uh, 11, 15 to 18, Luke 19, 45, 47, John 2, 12, 16, Matthew 24, 1, 2, Mark 13, 1, 2, Luke 21, 5, 6, Luke 21, 1, 4, John 2, 20, Luke 21, 20. The Gnostic Gospels, which compared to the biblical Gospels, lack historical detail, which the biblical Gospels are full of. So what we're seeing here is that our Gospels that we're reading, they're, they're not only um, near the time, they're also displaying an accurate knowledge of the area where Jesus lived. So there is information that we can use to know whether Jesus died or rose again. Finally, the Gospels are eyewitness account. And this is, a, this is scholarship that the Muslim community needs to engage with and hasn't engaged with yet. Uh, this book, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, and it'd be interesting to have another discussion on this, as recently in 2007, uh, and the reason is that uh, Richard Balcom has, has, has gone to... Uh, um, ancient uh, sources, uh, Roman and Greek biography, and has found that uh, the Gospels were written uh, based on Greek and uh, Roman biography. And one of the things about that is that the Gospels want to use eyewitnesses because the Roman historians, the Greek historians, based their ideas on a guy called Polybius, who was a second century uh, Greek and who said that one must use um, one must use eyewitness material. So, um, so the following evidence comes from the eyewitness of the gospel. Uh, sorry, the gospel is eyewitness testimony by uh, Richard Balcom. It is the contention of this book that in the period up to the writing of the gospel, gospel traditions were connected with name and known eyewitnesses. People who had heard the teaching of Jesus from his lips and committed it to memory. People who had witnessed the events of his ministry, death, and resurrection and themselves have formulated the story as they told. These eyewitnesses did not merely set going a process of oral transmission that soon went its own way without reference to them. They remained throughout their lifetime the source and in some sense that may have varied for figures of central or more marginal significance, the authoritative guarantors of the stories they continued to tell. The significance of that statement is this, since Rudolf Bultmann Many scholars, most scholars have seen that you go to the Gospels and realize it's just a patchwork of late community. And what, what uh, Balcom is saying here is that, no, actually there were guarantors of the tradition, that there were certain key people like Peter who guaranteed that the material would, would be passed on and maintained as truthful. Also, in this book, he talks about the inclusion. Mark, says Balcom, Mark in Inclusio makes Peter the principal eyewitness in the second gospel. The Inclusio is a technical term that Roman and Greek historians used. That they didn't actually use the name sometimes in the sources, but at the beginning and at the end of a, a, a book, they would hint indirectly that they were using a certain source. And uh, in this book, um, Richard Balcom goes into full detail uh, about this. Uh, and... and Bart Ehrman has made a response to this, but the academic world has, 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 has really began to move uh, quite, quite, quite a lot now in the favor. Even Elaine Pagels, who is a, a Gnostic scholar, admits there is eyewitness material now in the Gospels. And that's quite a remarkable thing that's happened in the academic world. How long have I got, guys? You've got one minute. We've got one minute. Yeah, well, so, one, one minute and 15 seconds. So what, what we've done here, we've looked at presuppositions. This is a massive scholarly area that even academics are not tackling properly today. We've looked at, uh, number two, we've looked at um, the, uh, the, early, that the Gospels are early source material. We've looked at uh, that the Gospels are accurate source, source material. 
talking about the historical times. And thirdly, we've looked at the um, the important the scholarship uh, by uh, Richard Balcom about eyewitnesses. Thank you very much. Well, thanks a lot, Pastor Jason. So, um, Akil, I just want to remind both participants, you've got to stay on topic. This is a debate about the sources of the resurrection. So um, just remember to stay on topic, and I'll give you a reminder when you've got one minute. So, Akil, your time will commence as soon as you address the mic. Okay, Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, <coughs> wa salatu wa salam wa rasulillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Burns, uh, for first invite for the debate um, and also for the presentation. And uh, I want to get right into the point. I want to also make a disclaimer. I apologize for my voice. Um, it may be a little bit um, coarse. I had um, some, some cough um, this past week, so I'm just getting over that. But Alhamdulillah, in time for the debate, and hopefully it's well enough uh, to convey what we want to cover. So the topic is, is the sources uh, of the resurrection of Jesus reliable? And I want to look at this in five points, as well as bring some other uh, surrounding um, evidences to make the case here, to show why we believe, at least as Muslims and other sources as well, um, that they're not actually reliable. So um, there are five sources, uh, five points that's taken from some historical um, uh, presentations. Historians note these points as, as things that they like to see when they're looking at historical documentation to verify whether it's reliable or not. As well as I went into the Islamic sciences to bring also a couple of sources to show on um, the veracity of Islamic sciences in comparison to Christian uh, sources and use that to examine um, the New Testament um, as a reliable source for the resurrection. When one wants to examine any narration of history, there are a few key factors that historians say must be in place when trying to obtain the closest and most accurate depiction of what actually occurred, if it occurred at all. From amongst them are the following, coupled with conditions from the Islamic sciences of hadith verification, and I think that we will find this noteworthy when we conclude. The first one is contemporary eyewitnesses. Now, um, Mr. Burns, he, he concluded with this by mentioning, uh, citing um, Richard Balcom's testimony that they're eyewitness, te uh, eyewitness in the New Testament. Um, when we look at uh, contemporary eyewitness testimony, um, this is our position. There's not a single eyewitness testimony or a single eyewitness reliable testimony in the history of Christianity until the present day. Uh, that can account for any such event of the resurrection or anything else. The crucifixion, that's just the bottom line. When we examine the gospel writers, because this first in, uh, in terms of uh, the Bible, we look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. None of them are eyewitness testimony to the fact. Maybe with the exception of, someone may quote John, but this is contingent and we look at this as we go along. Luke and Mark are not even con uh, contemporaries or disciples of Jesus, so they can never be eyewitness testimonies. Um, but there's not a single eyewitness testimony. When I say eyewitness testimony, someone that was actual eyewitness that wrote and testified to the fact. You can tell me there were thousands of eyewitnesses, but where is their testimony to the fact? In the court of law, if you don't have the testimony from eyewitness, you have absolutely nothing. So to say they were eyewitnesses, even quoting and uh, citing Richard Balcom, what eyewitnesses testimony do we have in any of the books of the New Testament? The belief in a resurrection, and that's all it is, is a belief, is based on an inference from the belief in the crucifixion, which we will touch on shortly. This inference comes from the ideology of Paul, because Paul is the one that said that if Jesus did not die and rise for us, then our, our faith is in vain. Uh, we, we are led astray in so many words. So this idea of the resurrection, crucifixion and resurrection, is the idea of Paul's, who's the first writer of the New Testament literature. 
Um, and we believe that the following gospels are a mirroring or a reflection of this ideology that Paul proposed early on in uh, the first century of Christianity. We continue, but as it relates to there ever being a single reliable eyewitness testimony to the event, in any fashion, no such person has ever existed. And this is just reality. And I, I would challenge uh, Mr. Burns to bring me one single eyewitness account who testified to the crucifixion or the resurrection. The existing accounts that we do find in the Bible about Jesus were not written at all by any contemporaries of Jesus or eyewitness testimonies um, to the fact. So not only is there not a contemporary eyewitness to the event of the resurrection, but there's not even a contemporary to give any eyewitness testimony to any event of the life, life of Jesus um, that we find as mentioned in the gospel. Another point that the historian, that's point number one. Point number two is another history, uh, uh, fact that historians like to see is multiple independent transmissions. They like to see that the account is repeated. And you have that in the New Testament. You have four gospels. So these gospels writers are writing uh, about the same event. So you do have this. But the problem is, given the fact that there is not a single eyewitness testimony and transmission of this event, and in particular, we're talking about the, the, the resurrection, then certainly there cannot be multiple independent transmissions of it. Even though you have four gospel writers and you have another writer by the name of Paul who writes um, at his own um, uh, independence and all, his own authority, according to his own testimony, but none of them are eyewitness testimonies to the fact. So even though there are multiple transmissions or there are multiple um, books on the life of Jesus, they're not written by multiple eyewitness testification. So by default, the Bible fails this point as well. Point number three, and this will be our longest point, so I ask you on uh, your patience to bear with me, but it's very um, informing here. Uh, consistency and testification of the narration, that there's not major contradictions in the stories. So let's say, for instance, the four gospel writers were eyewitnesses, um, but now we have to look at their stories and examine it. Are they consistent with each other? And if they're not consistent, then why? And this is also a, the a theological problem because according to Christian belief, and Jason can correct me if I'm wrong, but the Christians believe that the Gospels are, are, are inspired by God. So even though they were not eyewitness to the fact, like for instance, Mark and Luke, who were not disciples of Jesus, they were inspired by God. This adds another problem because if they were inspired by God, then you should find no contradictions amongst the books. Yet you find major and serious contradictions uh, amongst the four gospels and even the, um, the Acts and the, um, the books of Paul, that is of Paul. So as for the narration of the account that we do have to examine, which are only found in the Bible, and I want to state this clearly, that when we look at, uh, we say, sources of the resurrection, the primary and really only source that Christians can rely on, rely on is the Bible itself. There's not a historical shred of evidence whatsoever coming from the first century up until the 21st century uh, that anyone can say um, outside of the biblical text supports the resurrection. It'd be inference, it'd all be something speculation, but there's not a short of evidence outside the New Testament. And the New Testament is what we want to examine now. So when we look in, into the New Testament, um, the Bible, we have serious and unreconcilable differences. The first of them is that the biblical texts, as we have them now, since the inception, are written in Greek, in a classical elite Greek uh, at that. Yet the disciples of Jesus, who were eyewitness testimonies, they spoke Aramaic. Even according to the Bible, were illiterate. And this is a big problem because when you find the first writings of the um, New Testament, even though we don't have the original autographs, but even if you take the first copy from those, it's still written in a high educated Greek. The disciples were not educated. They didn't speak Greek. So that means that someone else besides them had to write these accounts. According to Acts 4.13, um, two disciples, Peter and John, who John, he, he writes the, um, the last of the four Gospels, and his Gospel is the latest coming at the end of the first century. Even some say the second century, begin second century. He's considered to be illiterate. So an illiterate man writing 70 years, 60, 70 years after the fact, 
about the life of Jesus and his gospel is considered to be non um, synoptic because it, it contradicts in many ways the other three. Uh, and he's a literate man. And he's writing in a classical type of Greek. This is a problem because it, it's not consistent. It doesn't. It doesn't meet. You know, what I'm saying the, um, it doesn't meet the standards of uh, historicity in terms of evaluating sources. Also, internal evidence make this point clear as well. By the way, of several contradictions. So, when we examine the stories of the New Testament and we find all of these contradictions, it undermines the authenticity and reliability of these documents as we have them. For instance, what day was Jesus crucified? This is important because, again, if this is inspired by God, then this should be something that should be accurate and no, no contradiction. If it wasn't inspired by God, then it's a historical problem. So no matter how you look at it, as an inspiration or as history, it's a problem. Who carried the cross? Was it Simon or was it Jesus? This is a problem, historically as well as um, uh, inspiration-wise. Uh, who went to the tomb? Uh, who were seen at the tomb? Did Jesus and disciples ever leave Jerusalem or did they stay? Um, these are clear problems that we have in the New Testament writings that serious contradictions that undermines, first and foremost, its historicity or its historical reliability as well as its idea or claim of inspiration. And inspiration is a bigger problem because now you're placing the mistake on God. And we say, I will be Vatic. We see God's protection from that. All of these are contradictions these countries are serious enough to render the narrations of the accounts unreliable. Now, I have a few questions on, on this uh, fact, or this point, point number three. Why was Jesus, and this is something for us to think about when we look at the intertextual um, analysis of the resurrection story. I want us to think about, you know, even if we take this on face value, that their sources are... Um, uh, has been protected and it goes back to the time of Jesus when we actually read the story itself There are many things that's, that's that stands out that just doesn't make sense to us That will give credence to the story itself rather they undermine the story and this is important So I have five quick questions that I want to examine and then we move on One is why was Jesus disguised as a gardener supposedly after the alleged resurrection? if Jesus had died and he had rose again. Why was he disguised as a gardener, according to John 20, 15, and Mary Magdalene thought he was a gardener? This is something that we have to ask, answer to, because it, it would make no sense for Mary, someone who knew Jesus very well, and who some people call her the beloved servant, I mean, the beloved uh, companion of Jesus, uh, some, some list her as that. Why would she not recognize him and think he was a gardener? Question number two. Why then the disciples of Jesus recognize him and believe in him? We read in Luke chapter 24, 11, Peter says the idea when Mary came back after telling them that Jesus had resurrected or Jesus was gone, he was in the tomb, he said, this is fables, this is nonsense. Now this undermines the idea and the, the, the idea that Jesus prophesied his death and resurrection. If Jesus prophesied his death and resurrection, why would he, uh, why would the disciples say the idea of him being resurrected be nonsense? So uh, this undermines that idea. And many scholars also don't believe that Jesus prophesied his death and resurrection. And Paul says, according to the scripture, that he would die and be raised up again uh, three days in, uh, after three days, according to the scripture. There's nowhere in any scripture that says that. So Paul is quoting scripture, but what scripture is he quoting to, uh, to support his claim? We don't find it nowhere in the Old Testament or the New Testament. Number three, why did Jesus seem so hungry? When we, uh, when we, when we look at his life, we find Jesus, um, he ate, he broke, he broke bread, and then again he appears to his disciples. Uh, after being with them for a half a day, they didn't recognize him. And then he, when, he, when he met them, he asked them, do you have anything to eat? The point here, this, this is a theological um, problem for us. If you're saying that Jesus conquered death and he's resurrected and he's no more dependent upon his physical body, why is he continually eating and asking for food and obviously appearing to be hungry? Is these are things just to think about. 
when we look at this story, we just can't take it on face value anymore. We have to examine these things. And, 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 and looking at these things logically is part of the examination. Question number four, why did Jesus refuse to leave Jerusalem and also command the disciples the same? As we find in Acts 1-4, Luke 24, 49-43, he says, stay here in Jerusalem and don't go outside this area. So why is that? The, the, the contention is that because he's still evading the people who tried to kill him, he don't want to make himself broadcasted to people, so he's staying low-key, as we say. Um, and this was, was understood from these kind of events. He's disguised. He's not being recognized. He's appearing and not appearing. Um, he's saying, don't go over here. Um, and then the fifth question to, to, to complement all of this is, why didn't Jesus just appear to Pilate and those who ordered him to be killed from amongst the Jews um, to prove that he truly conquered death and was who he, who he said he was. If Jesus had truly conquered death and resurrected and know that he cannot be killed anymore because he's a resurrected body, why not appear to all of these people and why not have his appearance recorded by eyewitnesses in mass? Paul is the only one that says he appeared to more people, like over 500. But where from amongst those 500 is any eyewitness testification to that fact? We have absolutely none. Absolutely none other than what the Gospels provide for us. And like, like we mentioned, we believe the Gospel writings are mirroring or portraying of the theology that Paul proposed early on since his writings was the first. So this is point number three, and we have five questions there. We move quickly to point number four, which is authenticated, complete chain transmission. And these last two points are taken from the Islamic sciences, and we move them very quickly so we can get to some points uh, to mention um, in closing. But an authenticated, complete chain of transmission means that if you have a testification from someone, they can relate who they got it from and relate who they got it from back to its original source to verify that this source is, uh, is veracity meets standards. If I say something now that something happened, how can you verify it happened unless you could trace it back to someone? Similarly, like we have our family tree. How can you claim to be from this descendant or have this people in, in your genealogy if you can't trace your family tree? We can't believe the Bible on face value because the Bible, or well, people say you should believe in the Bible. I want to have something substantial and concrete in order for me to base my belief on it. And when we look and examine the New Testament, we just don't have that. That's the reality of the matter. And then the fifth point is verification of the people that we do have in the chain. So when we look at those people that actually exist in this narration, we can look at their character, we can look at their acumen, we can look at things about them and say, you know something, this person is reliable, he said this from this person, and on and on like that. We have none of this whatsoever as it comes to New Testament uh, literature and history. And if one makes a claim that, well, this wasn't the way of the people of old, um, this is just not accurate. Because the people of old were very uh, particular about citing their sources. For instance, we have an article that was written um, by a gentleman by the name of Matthew Ferguson. Um, he has a very nice article, article, and he mentions 10 points as it relates to history and verifying sources. Um, but I only dealt with five that I got from other sources and from the Islamic sciences. But he mentions ancient historical works at the beginning or someone else within the body of the narrative are often prefaced with statements from the author about the period they will be investigating, the methodology they will be using, and the types of sources they will be discussing. None of the Gospels, with the exception of a very brief statement at the beginning of Luke, even come close to following this convention. And this is, this is pre-Jesus time. This is... Um, third, second, first century before Jesus and afterwards. So we can't say it didn't exist because it's clear it did exist. This was the style of those who wrote history. And we have a, a list of, um, of historical writers um, that done such and follow such standards. But he says, none of the gospels with the exception of a very brief statement at the beginning of Luke even come close to following this convention. Furthermore, the opening of Luke is hardly substantial enough to consider it, consider it of the same caliber as actual historical prose. As scholar Marion Swords, and he notes this from the Oxford Annotated Bible, page 1,827, he notes the in initial four verses of the book are a single Greek sentence that forms a highly stylized introductory statement typical of ancient historical writings. 
after this distinctive preface, however, the narrative shifts into a style of Greek reminiscent of the Septuagint. As such, while Luke mimics some of the conventions of historical writing at the beginning of the gospel, the rest of the narrative reverts into storytelling typical of, of other gospels. Uh, so this is basically the conclusion that they make. The, gospel in, the gospels in the New Testament basically um, boils down to being uh, on the same par as a novel because it has nothing that we can really use to validate uh, its historical sources and use um, to, to, to prove that. Uh, I think my time is coming to a close. So You've I, got I, one minute. You've okay. got one minute remaining. Uh, one minute. Um, I want to say some other things, but, um, I, oh, quickly, um, um, Jason, he cited um, Paul about the gospel and preaching another gospel. I want us to keep this in mind as we go out through this debate because it's interesting that Paul is contending with other people about his view of Jesus. Paul never knew Jesus. He was very ignorant of Jesus. It is many things that he never quote or talks about Jesus. I mean, for instance, Paul never talks about uh, the life of Jesus. He don't cite spiritual resurrection, nor does he, I mean, he cites only as spiritual. He doesn't cite the, the empty tomb. He doesn't cite the virgin birth. There's many things in the life of Jesus that Paul leaves out. Why? Because of his ignorance of Jesus. Yet, over 50% of the New Testament is written by Paul. The major theology of the New Testament is written by Paul. Um, the whole doctrine of crucifixion and resurrection for salvation is introduced by Paul. Yet, this Fine. individual Paul is not a reliable source for us to depend upon. And because of that, we have to conclude that the sources of the New Testament or the resurrection is not reliable. Thank you. Right, Jason, so you've got 10 minutes to respond to Akil and your time will begin as soon as uh, you commence. I'll give you a one minute warning <coughs> at the end as well. So, so you, you can help, you can keep track of time as well. Okay. Okay. You challenged me uh, about uh, eyewitnesses. Uh, I was given in scholarship that the academic world has not fully dealt with properly. It's only since 2007 that Richard Balcom's book has been out and uh, it's rocked the academic world. Even an atheist, Dr. Crosley at Sheffield University uh, admits that this is a very powerful book. Uh, Dr. Burridge has written uh, extensively on it and the academic world is coming round to the view that there is eyewitness material in the gospel. That's just a basic academic fact. And Oxford University and Cambridge need to catch up with Sheffield University and other academics in the field they are actually seeing the, the, the light uh, on that issue. Uh, in John chapter 1, it says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we were seen. Are, we, are you ready? With our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifest with us. There's no eyewitness account concerning the Islamic view that Jesus didn't die, but we here have eyewitness material clearly stated in 1 John. And you can read a number of areas in the Gospels that it's based on eyewitness material. Um, so that's the, the one point dealt with. Um, second point, uh, historical multiple independent sources, uh, the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, in Matthew and, in Matthew and uh, Luke, uh, there's 92% of Mark within those Gospels. However, there is 500 verses in Matthew that is not in any that is independent of Matthew, and there are 300 verses in Luke that are independent of Luke. What you see here is that there are independent historical sources. There are four independent historical sources in those Gospels, and one of the things that the academic world uh, and it's and uh, Boltman has, has crumbled now in the academic world. But the academic world was hampered by Boltman's ideas about sources behind the Gospels, the Q source and whatever. And we need to, the, the academic world need, and, and, and we need to look at this a, a lot more objectively rather than polemic. There is much more sophisticated uh, historical writing going on in those four Gospels than even the academic world is willing to admit. Uh, on the issue of consistency, um, I'm just trying to consistency. Um, 
uh, I, I can't remember what that issue was there. But consistency, um, all Dominic Crossan says that Jesus died under Pontius Pilate. But if we just look at the consistency in the academic world here, just for a second, if I can get the, the notes. Sorry. I just want to deal with this issue of consistency. Consistency. Bart Ehrman says, one of the most certain facts of history is that Jesus was crucified under the orders of Roman prefect of Judea, Pontius Pilate. Um, liberal Dominic, Dominic, Crossan, Dominic Crossan, that Jesus was crucified is as sure as anything historical ever can be. And there is consistency. You can, you can point to all these minutiae, what happened here, what happened there. They seem to be contradicting each other. But all the Gospels and all the New Testament writers are consistent that Jesus died and rose again. All the minutiae detail, that if it was doctored, they'd make it all perfect. But because it's not all perfect, it shows you they've not doctored the information. So there is a, a, an honest consistency there by showing the difficulties within the text. They're being honest. If they were lying, they would hide and, 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 and bring these, uh, get rid of these. The other thing I'd like to say is that we have uh, Josephus testifies in the Arabic translation uh, that Jesus died under Pontius Pilate. We have Tacitus who clearly states and he makes it clear when he's using the source, uh, if he's using the source from Rome uh, and whether he's not using the source from Rome. And, he, and he's making it clear uh, that he's using sources where he's saying that Jesus died under Pontius Pilate. We have, um, we have, um, a letter from Pliny that says the Christians believed Jesus uh, was God and, and, and they, were, they believed that Jesus uh, was to be worshipped. That is a letter showing the Christians were being persecuted for believing in these things they were testifying to. So we have uh, Lucian of Samosa, we have Phallus, we have many sources outside. It's ridiculous to say that we don't have any of these sources. Only internet atheists, my friend, will say these kind of things. No reputable scholar Dale Orty is not a reputable scholar. Uh, Dr. Price is not a reputable scholar in the academic world on historical Jesus studies. These are fringe scholars, and, and the Muslims are getting their ideas from these kind of people. Uh, and, you know, Bart Ehrman would not agree. Um, linguistic studies uh, on the issue of uh, the, these people were, were not educated. Well, Muhammad was not educated, but he was supposed to have written the Quran. But linguistic sources, we've discovered thousands of manuscripts in the ancient world, in, in, in Egypt. And we found the Nakamani literature, and it shows that there was much more higher literacy than even scholars are really willing to engage with today. Uh, uh, another example is, um, is uh, if we take, sorry about this, my eyes are, are not very good. But um, you can see here, we found a document uh, in the ancient world in, in Egypt. It says this, I am Isis, the queen of every land. That, that document clearly shows that when Jesus says, ego I am, in the Gospel of John, that John is being honest and, and, and saying what Jesus is saying because it's rooted in the language of that time. The other thing as well about uh, John, John Bunyan, for example, was, a, was one of the most uneducated people of his time, yet he wrote the greatest one of the greatest books ever lived, which was Pilgrim Progress. So just because uh, you're not educated doesn't mean you can't write uh, amazing books or scholarly works. So that's prejudicial. The other thing as well is uh, John, um, I'm just trying to think, I'm getting a bit tired now. Um, well, I'm just thinking about John. Uh, oh, yeah, fishermen were not that poor in those days. Actually, it was quite a wealthy uh, job to do. So, you know, it could have been more educated than you realized of resources. The other thing as well is people did have access, access to key libraries in central areas that Rome provided. Another thing as well is that slaves uh, were taken from various parts of the ancient world and uh, they were educated. They could have been used as emanuenses for uh, gospel writers if need be. So uh, I've lost my, my train of thought now. Oh, yeah, here we are. So that's dealing with... Um, John couldn't have written it because he was not educated in Greek. Um, contradictions, Dale Allison has said that eyewitnesses generally get the minutiae wrong, but they never get the big details. Dale Allison is one of the great academics of our time. He doesn't believe what I say. So these minutiae issues are, not the, are just a, a smoke screen. 
The big issue is nobody in the academic world of any repute actually says that Jesus didn't die. They all agree with that. And all the main academics agree, even Dale Allison, who disagrees with me, they all agree that even the disciples believe that Jesus rose from the dead. And then finally, uh, a, a landmark book that no Muslim scholar, no Muslim debater should go without reading. N.T. writes, The Resurrection of the Son of God, did an extensive study on, uh, on the uh, resurrection. He looked at all the ancient sources, Jewish and Greek sources, and this is the killer argument that cannot be defeated. He says, there is no difference between pagans, Jews, and Christians. They all understood the Greek word Anastasia and its cognates and other related terms as we shall meet to mean new life after a period of being dead. Pagans denied this possibility. Some Jews affirmed it as long-term future hope. Virtually all Christians claimed that it had happened to Jesus and would happen to them in the future. All of them were speaking of the new life uh, after. That's uh, in page 31 of his book, uh, The Resurrection of the Son of God by N.T. Wright. The significance of that statement is no way in a million years as a Muslim or as an atheist, a Christian or anybody can say that they had visions or they were lying or anything like that. You see, the Greeks, the Jews, they believed in a physical resurrection. So no Jew would say Jesus rose from the dead unless they actually believed it. One minute. They believed it. So I've not dealt with all, his, his, all, his, all the points that he said, but I, I hope I've dealt with as many as I can. On the, on the scholarship, my friend, he, he's not in touch with all the scholarship. He can quote from a dictionary. I'm calling you for books, books that I've read that you can go and read for yourself. Thank you. Right. Thanks a lot, Pastor Jason. So, Akhil, the same applies to you. You'll get a one-minute alert at the nine-minute mark, and your time will begin as soon as you're ready. evidence which I thought was interesting and I thought it was going to go with a little more detail and that he didn't um, suppositions uh, he didn't, didn't went to the Quran um, about the Quran um, not being trusted because of um, some things about the Prophet Muhammad so them, and his marriage to one of his wives um, Um, so let's start here. Bible gives us history. Um, this is a statement that um, Jason mentioned, that the Bible actually gives us history. We're not negating that there's historical uh, elements in the Bible. Even um, Bar Army calls them like kernels, like of truth that you find within it. But you also find things that's not accurate in it. For instance, um, there's a difference that's a point of the points mentioned, the difference between uh, hagiography and biography. So it says... The Gospels, in contrast, are not historical biographies. They're not historical biographies, but can be more aptly described as hagiographies, written in unquestioning praise of their messianic subject. Although the genia of Christian lives of saints developed after the Gospels, they can still be regarded as hagiographical. Uh, and that they function as laudatory biographies um, praising the subject rather than a critical biographies as a good representation of the scholarly consensus about the rhetorical aims of the Gospels. So basically what the Gospels are is the writings that's praising someone um, in this particular incident is Jesus, um, but not really being critical in looking at history as related to that. Um, so no, we don't accept that uh, the Bible is valid historically because it, it, it deviates away from the historic norms of giving us historical documentation. And uh, Jason has brought nothing uh, to answer my arguments about that. He said he maybe try to cover as much as he can. Unfortunately, he didn't cover much at all. Um, uh, modern scholarship fact uh, about um, the Bible. I think if you look at modern scholarship as we see the Bible, uh, the uh, modern scholarship 
uh, in fact, fails uh, the Bible as it relates to being a reliable source for many things um, because of its problems uh, that we uh, that we mentioned in our opening statement. Um, he mentioned Quran being 600 years later than um, the uh, old um, the, 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 the Gospels. I want to, if we can, put a stop to this whole idea of the Quran being 600 years later. Um, this is something that Christians have to stop using because it actually goes against you even more so. Um, the New Testament writings are over a thousand years after the Old Testament writings. And there's gross contradictions from the New Testament to the Old Testament. So if you want to use this argument of the Quran being 600 years later after the fact of Jesus of Islam and how could the Quran get anything right about him because it's 600 years later, how could the Old Testament be um, uh, a source um, that's talked about by the New Testament when the New Testament comes over a thousand years later, 900 to a thousand years later, and quotes, uh, I mean, quotes are wrong, quotes are not there, uh, things are mistaken. For instance, uh, we have in Matthew the prophecy that's forged where he says that out of Egypt, my son came out of Egypt, or I took my son out of Egypt. Um, when you look at this passage in Hosea that it's talking about, it's talking about people who worship idols. It's got nothing to do with Jesus. So this is a gross misunderstanding of the previous scriptures that's being forced to try to make Jesus something that they wanted him to make, make him into. Um, so this argument about the Quran 600 years later, it's a terrible argument that Christians using and it backfires on you when we apply the same standard to you in the Old Testament. Uh, so in the future, Jason, I would advise don't use the argument because it becomes very embarrassing. Um, Ignatius testimony of Jesus, in a theological point on this, uh, on this here, Ignatius testimony of Jesus, he testified that Jesus being uh, someone that had human nature. Uh, on a theological uh, plateau, the resurrection makes no sense because if you say God died, that's a problem. Now, we, we, we're not discussing the Trinity, but we need to keep this in mind that who died on the cross? Was it Jesus? Who resurrected Jesus? Was it God? So when you, when you look at these things, theologically, the resurrection uh, makes no sense. Um, but that's something we can discuss later on. It came to mind as he was mentioning it. Uh, Gospels were rel reliable. Um, the Gospels, unfortunately, are not reliable. Um, and, and, and that's the reality of the matter. And we gave some examples of that. Contradictions, uh, no eyewitness testimony. He mentioned eyewitness. I mentioned eyewitness testimony. I want someone to testify uh, who's eyewitness. He mentioned the first John. I want to ask you, who wrote the book of the first book of John? What John is it? There were several Johns at that time. What John actually wrote this one? What John actually wrote the first, the, the gospel John? Um, this discussion amongst Christian scholars and biblical scholars of who these people are. We don't know anything about them. The names of the writers of the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they came much later after the gospels, the, the writings themselves. Who put these names on these these writings, and why didn't any of the gospel writers ever themselves mention who they were and say, this is my work, and mention their name? Matthew written in the third person. John written in the third person. Luke written in the first person, but he's not a disciple or an eyewitness. Mark is the first person to write. He's the youngest of all of them, yet everyone copied from him. So when you analyze this literature, it's just so many problems with it that you cannot accept it to be reliable. That's just the reality of the matter. That's what we're dealing with. Um, does it give some historical facts of what happened? Yes, it does. But is this enough for us to base our, uh, our salvation on? Uh, no, it's not. And I'm still waiting for uh, Jason to bring me one eyewitness testimony, for instance, to the crucifixion, to the resurrection. Bring me something from one of those who've seen it and wrote about it from their own, in their own words. Matthew and Luke independent from Mark. Um, yeah, he mentioned a small section which shows what? That, okay, they had other sources. But again, if Mark is the youngest of all of the, the people writing in age-wise, yet he's uh, the earliest writer out of the Gospels, and Matthew, supposed to be an eyewitness, is copying from a person who wasn't there, I mean, what does that say about your literature? I mean, examine this. Think about this. I mean, this is, this is serious stuff to consider. You have someone who was an eyewitness writing about Jesus in his life, and then people who supposedly was an eyewitness copying from him. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, consistency, Bar Ehrman says so. Um, Bar Ehrman, uh, he is a, a secular writer and a historian, and he's, he's writing uh, from a secular perspective. But if you use Bar Ehrman to substantiate the fact that he's giving credence to things that happen according to biblical testimony, 
you don't use Bart Ehrman to justify the resurrection because Bart Ehrman doesn't believe in the resurrection. Why? Because he doesn't, he, he, he doesn't feel, as a historian, he can verify supernatural occurrences. Now, the discussion is not about the, the Quran or the Quran position, but it's necessary to bring here the position of the Quran on a, on a crucifixion is that it was a supernatural um, occurrence that happened in which God saved Jesus supernaturally. So we're not expecting people like Bart Ehrman or anyone else to, to believe in the Quranic picture of the crucifixion, just as you don't expect him to believe in your story of the resurrection. So if you're going to hold um, Bart Ehrman as credential, uh, as, um, as verifiable for the crucifixion, but yet deny him for the resurrection, then I'm going to use your same principle to show why he don't even believe in the crucifixion because a supernatural event occurred. Just that he don't believe in the earthquakes, he don't believe in the whole world going dark, he don't believe in the curtain splitting, he don't believe in zombies running from the grave. All of these things happen at the same time with the crucifixion. Why don't Bart Ehrman believe in these things as well? So you can't call him for the idea of Jesus dying, but then even all the other things that happen at the same time that supposedly was historical in the Bible, but there's no historical documentation or facts or testimony to it. You can't have your cake eat it too, Jason. I'm sorry. Um, Joseph, jo Josephus and Tacitus. Um, this is redaction. Uh, Josephus mentions very little. He does mention about Jesus, but again, he's just quoting from what the Christians said. He was an eyewitness, and neither, neither was Tacitus. The late first century, going to the second century, they're not eyewitness testimonies. Bring me someone that's seen it and wrote about it, and that we can look at the document to see whether or not it's valid and reliable or not. You don't have any, and we're still waiting for it. Um, Muhammad not educated, but wrote the Quran. That wasn't that point that we was making. The point we was making is that you have early documents written by people who could not write in another language. And the Quran is a miracle in that, in, in that sense. Um, the people who wrote the Gospels, were they really believing they were writing God's word? When Luke stated in the beginning of his Gospel that I'm writing because everyone else is writing and I see fit to do so, is he saying I'm writing because I'm inspired by God? Did Luke believe he was writing God's word? I don't think that he believed that. Neither did Matthew, neither did Mark, neither did John. Uh, but nonetheless... Akil, you, you've got one minute. Okay. Well, less than one minute, 30 seconds. Okay, okay. all right. Um, so, and then he mentioned access to key libraries, which is important. If there was access to libraries, that means that, um, that, that there was serious academic literature being written. How come the Bible doesn't follow the same genre in terms of its literary, its literary style and academic approach to history? Um, I'll close with that. Right, thanks a lot for that. Uh, to end the debate on the part of uh, Pastor Jason, he'll have five minutes to conclude, and likewise with Akil. So take it away, Pastor Jason, when you're ready, please. Okay. Uh... On the issue of uh, academic work uh, with uh, writers, it says in Luke, it says, For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us from the very beginning, were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also, having had made perfect understanding of all things from the very first right unto the in order most excellent Theophilus. Uh, Luke uses the Greek word eyewitnesses. It gets, it's the exact Greek word that Polybius uses in the second century BC. Polybius said you must use eyewitness material. He was a household name in the first century AD. He wrote in the second century BC. All the main historians in the first century AD, uh, Josephus, Tacitus, and all the others, copied uh, Lucius uh, Samosa, copied, and Luke copied. Polybius. They wanted to use eyewitness material, my friend, and that is where modern scholarship is going at the present time, realizing this. Um, eyewitnesses, um, we'll, get, we'll, get, oh, uh, we'll get to more eyewitnesses in, in the minute. It says uh, it, the, we have historical record of Phallus, 52 AD, says uh, there was a darkness. We have record of Pliny the Younger, 61, Suetonius, Tacitus, Marsarabian, Philogon, Lucian of Samosa, Celsus. Uh, we have uh, the historical record of Josephus, the Jewish Talmud. Uh, all these uh, sources are outside sources, and it's what is called multiple attestation. 
when you get enemies telling you that things have happened on the, the other side, it tells you that that's probably something has happened. And uh, that's why uh, Gerd Ludemann, an atheist, said it is historically certain that Peter and the other disciples had experienced after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ. That's why Bart Ehrman, you said, uh, believed in the, the, that Jesus died, but he didn't believe in the resurrection. But Bart Ehrman would agree, as well as uh, Gerd Ludemann, the atheist, they would agree that the disciples believed and saw a resurrection. And you've not engaged with any of the scholarship of uh, Richard Balcom, where it talks about inclusio. I said right at the beginning that scholarship has begun to see these eyewitnesses. We have what is called the inclusio within the Gospel of Mark. That is indication that he's using Peter's material. And I, and I give you a challenge. Compare Acts chapter 2, Peter's sermon, with the Gospel of Mark. And they are very similar, showing you that Mark is rooted in Peter's eyewitnesses, uh, as an eyewitness. In Mark chapter 6, verse 9 and 11, John chapter 20, verse 1, 118, we have Mary Madeleine, Matthew 28, verse 9 and 10, we have other woman, Luke 24, 32, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 5, we have Peter, uh, Luke 24, 13, 35, Mark 16, 12, we have the Emmaus disciples, uh, 10 disciples in Mark 16, 14, Luke 24, 26, 42, John 20, 19, 25, 11 disciples in John 20, 26, 31, 1 Corinthians 15, 5, Seven disciples in John 21, 125. 500 brethren in 1 Corinthians 15, 6. We have James as an eyewitness, 1 Corinthians 15, 7. 11 disciples in Galilee, Matthew 28, 16, 20. Mark 16, 15 to 18. And 11 disciples in Acts 1, 3, uh, ch chapter 1, verse 3, 12. Are we saying that uh, Peter and Luke and all these disciples were lying? Are we saying that, or, or are you saying that uh, Allah deceived these people and they've gone on uh, being deceived? Uh, where is the evidence to back up the Quran's claim that Jesus didn't die? Who, who was it uh, that did die on that cross? Uh, and also it is important, and it's not a way of, you, you can't get out of this, my friend. The Quran came 600 years after you. The, the Old Testament is a different ball game to, 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 to the Quran. The Old Testament has been verified hundreds and hundreds of times of being historically accurate. The, uh, the liberals said that there were no Hittite empire. Uh, the, 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 the Old Testament got it wrong in the 19th century. L late in the 19th century, we found information that there was an Hittite empire. The, the Old Testament was proved to be right. The, the actual um, writing of the Quran uh, has never been shown to be very historical, and the Quran doesn't claim to be his, a historical. You've got one minute. But uh, we, we, have, we have, sorry, when you want information, When, when you want information, sorry about this. We have 89 confirmed facts by scholar, historian Colin Hermer in, in the uh, book of Acts. 80 confirmed facts. He's a scholar, he's a skeptic, but he says there are 80 facts based in the Gospel of Luke. We have 59 historical confirmed facts in the Gospel of John uh, by, uh, by Craig uh, Blomberg. Uh, the Quran has nothing like this, has no historical detail. If it does have anything about Jesus, it, it, it uses the infancy Gospels, which, which are Gnostic Gospels, which are later than the four Gospels. I've given you solid historical evidence to show that the Gospels are early. I've shown you that they're historically reliable. I've given you cutting edge research in N.T. Wright and Richard Balcom. And uh, your arguments are mainly theological and, um, and, and uh, maybe a few questions here and there which I've not been able to answer. Uh, but there we are, that's, that's where I finish. Time, thank you. So, Akhil, if you wanna just end off with your five minutes, um, you'll have to unmute your mic. Okay, bismillah. Um, so in closing, um, the topic was um, out of his sources uh, of the um, resurrection uh, reliable. Uh, this is what we ha come here to discuss, are the sources of the resurrection reliable. Um, so what I presented um, was historical look at uh, the sources themselves. And basically the only true source that we have um, is the Bible itself. 
um, because this is where everything originates from. So we looked at some aspects, eyewitness testimony, uh, consistency, and, and things like that. Um, and now I want to get into something in closing, and then I'm going to address some of the points that um, Jason made in closing. But I want us to look at when the, when the gospel, because this is a question he asked that we have to consider. When we're looking at the gospel writings, um, what happened in the time of Jesus is things happened. And then people, for some time, there was a lapse. There was nothing happening. There was no one writing any gospels down. Maybe for 25, 30, 35 years, there was basically silence uh, that was kind of taking place at that time. And then people begin from their memories and from oral culture to kind of rewrite what they remember from the past or what they heard from the past, stories being passed down. In that kind of activity, people are trying to remember things. They're adding stories. They're adding things. And they're dressing up history. So you have history, but it's shrouded by a lot of uh, folklore and a lot of uh, exaggeration. And I'll give you, I'll give you an example. Um, um, Thucydides, for example, in his preface and history of the Peloponnesian War, he says, now, as much as particular persons gave speeches, either entering the war or when it was already taking place, it has been difficult for me to remember precisely the exact words that were spoken, either from those that I heard myself or from those that I was informed of by others. And so my practice has been to make each speaker say what I regard as the most suitable words that the occasion demanded, while I hearing as close as possible to the general sense of what, the, what was actually spoken. So basically what he's saying is this, I can't give you exactly what happened, but I'm going to fill in the blanks and give you the best of my ability, and I may add some things and take some things away. And this is what happened to the, 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 New, the New Testament. From the very beginning, from the very beginning, it was plagued with people adding things to it that wasn't there. Unfortunately, Paul came first, and he introduced a theology, and people came along and followed that theology and added later. Um, and this is what you have. So now, in our present day, we have history shrouded by storytelling, by folklore, by things that really wasn't uh, happening. And this is why you have so many uh, contradictions and inconsistency. That's the reality of the matter, and this is a, uh, a work that's being presented on the New Testament. Um, eyewitnesses in Luke. He keeps saying about eyewitnesses that Luke called eyewitnesses. Where are his eyewitnesses? What's their name? What eyewitnesses is he referring to? To say I got it from eyewitnesses means nothing unless you tell me who those eyewitnesses were. I don't know the eyewitnesses Luke got it from. And we can't infer that Mark got it from Peter because there's similarities there um, only. I mean, we need to hear from the fact that even Mark wrote this gospel because the gospel attributed to Mark doesn't have Mark's signature on it. You believe it's from Mark. This is what you believe, but there's no signature of Mark. And why would Mark write a gospel about Jesus, taking information from Peter, if Peter was eyewitness? Why not Peter write the gospel? How do you have a non-eyewitness, a non-disciple of Jesus, writing more about Jesus than those who was with him? It, it doesn't make any sense. It's reverse history. You don't take information from somebody that came later and then someone that was there copy from someone that wasn't there. It's the opposite way around. But you're telling me that because there's similarities in the gospel of Mark and Peter, Mark must have got it from Peter, yet Peter didn't write it. He didn't write the gospel. There's no gospel of Peter. So that's not in the Bible anyway. There used to be. One um, minute. Huh? One minute left? Um, so I went to testimonies. You mentioned all these verses. We don't have any testimony from them. We have someone saying that this person seen this and this person sees that. Where is their documentation? Where is their gospel? Gospel? Where is their letter? Where are them saying, I seen this and my name is such and such so we can verify who they were? Not someone appending a name to writings, uh, 102nd century. Um, now names become put on the gospel writers uh, that was there. Uh, this is unacceptable, and it's not historical. Um, I mean, there's a lot of information uh, to go over. Our time is short, but I think these questions are something we have to consider. We have to really look and examine how is the historical presentation of the Bible backwards from the normal standard history of writing, even from that time. It, it doesn't add up, and it doesn't conform to reliable historical writings. Therefore, we have to conclude that the sources of the resurrection, which is primarily the Bible, the New Testament itself, is not reliable, and we cannot rely upon it as a, a, a historical document for such an activity. Is there any time left? No. Okay, thank you. That's it. I close. So I don't know now if we're going to do 
um, some questions and answers. Because, uh, I mean, these, these periods are very short. There's a lot of information to cover. So I hope maybe there's some follow-up. We can do some questions and answers to get the, um, Jason a little more opportunity to bring some things he wanted to bring, and as well as myself. Yeah, okay. Well, let's see what Jason's... Uh, Jason, do you want to un unmute your mic? We've got... We, we've had consistently over 20 people in the room uh, throughout the debate. We've got 19 now. Um, I suspect a lot of them have questions. Jason, do you want to do a Q&A? I, I didn't prepare for this. I'll, I'll, I'll take a few questions, um, but I prefer it if it's like one question. Is it from the audience or from... Yeah, it would be from the audience. So we've got like, I mean, uh, I did put it out in the Apologetics Academy. I've stopped recording. Uh, I know you're, uh, well, you two can carry on recording because it's good to have your Q&As uh, recorded. Um, so there they could be some Christians in the room as well. So I'll give, if there is a Christian in the room and you want to ask, the, ask a question. Oh, I know Pastor Bashoff was here, but he's left now. You've got the first opportunity. Any Christians? I, 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 um, what, wouldn't it be better if me and... Uh, oh, you, you two want to get... Yeah, because what happened is you, you did veer off topic as well, Jason. You started talking about... Uh, oh, uh, Stephen wants to ask a question. So I'll let Elder Stephen ask his question and then you two can have a, uh, a back and forth, okay? So Elder Stephen, do you want to unmute your mic and just ask your question? Okay, I want to thank Pastor Jason. I think he did an excellent job uh, with the material, and I really appreciated the um, uh, uh, the tie-in between uh, the second chapter in Acts and um, and the Gospel of Mark. I, I really didn't know that, so thank you so much for that little piece of information. Uh, I guess my question is for Akio uh, and Bart Ehrman. Bart Ehrman does uh, believe in the uh, in the resurrection, or I'm sorry, in the crucifixion, denies the resurrection, and yet, uh, Akil, you said on a number of uh, number of occasions, and I agree with you, that the um, the main sources for the uh, crucifixion and resurrection, of course, are are the are, are the are the four gospels as well as the rest of the New Testament. Uh, why, you know, but Bart Ehrman rejects the supernatural. I mean, if he was going to be consistent, he would have to reject everything. And so he uses, uh, and, uh, and, and and my Muslim friends seem to fall, uh, fall into the same trap. You will, uh, you reject the New, New Testament because it's supernatural. All the arguments that, that I've heard from the Muslims uh, take a, a naturalistic uh, approach to, uh, uh, to rejecting the um, uh, the New Testament, they don't really use. Um, and I didn't get a lot of a whole bunch of scholarship. I got some, but not a whole bunch of scholarship. So maybe uh, Akio and Pastor Jason, you could comment on what I said. Go ahead. Um, I go first, or Jason going to go first? So. Doesn't matter. Jason, you want to go first, or you might, Jason, uh, I'm, I'm you. you. You can go first if you want, brother. Okay, so, um, well, um, to begin, I, I didn't uh, cite Bart Ehrman. I was kind of following up of what um, Jason mentioned about Bart Ehrman. Uh, so, and yes, it is supernatural, but when you have supernatural occurrences, <laughs> then we can believe in supernatural occurrences. We're Muslims. We believe in the unseen. We believe in God. We believe in miracles. But in order for us to believe in such activities or events, then we need to verify the source by which it, it reached us. And if we can't verify that source, if we can't say this source is reliable to go back to its original event, then we have a problem. Because now you're expecting me to believe it just because you said it. If that's a premise, then I tell you, you should believe in the Quran because the Quran says so. But why do you reject the Quran? Because you have another premise which you're based on. This goes back to um, Jason's period about uh, the, um, being biased and presuppositions. So uh, there's no way I'm going to accept something from the Bible just because you say the Bible said I should believe it. I want to examine it. 
And when I examine it historically, uh, the events that come to me, they're not consistent and they're not reliable enough for me to base my salvation upon. Um, I see too many problems, too many inconsistencies, uh, too many um, things that gives credence to the fact that something happened that wasn't genuine, interpolation, things taken out. Even to today, there's uh, verses put in, verses put out, um, depending on what Bible version you have. So these things are a problem for me. Um, and this is the reason why I won't believe in it uh, on face value. And when I examine it historically, uh, it fails the test for me to accept it. I'll read this. Fundamentalism by Malays Ruthven. It says, higher critical scholarship of the Quran using methodologies adopted from biblical criticism is still largely confined to scholars working in Western universities. So sensitive is this area for Muslims that Ibn Warak, a Muslim-born writer trained in Arabic who accepts the findings of radical Western scholarship, has felt it necessary to publish his work under a pseudonym. The Egyptian academic Nasu Abu Zayed who ventured to use modern literary critical methodology in his approach to the Quran was forced into exile. Higher criticism of the Quran where the text is deconstructed in accordance with methods developed by biblical scholars since the 18th century is still very largely confined to scholars who are not Muslims. Examples include the work of John Wainsborough, Patricia Crone, and General H uh, Gerald Horty. The point why I quoted that is that the Muslim, the Muslim apologists love to quote Bart Ehrman, but who is the Bart Ehrman of the Muslim world? You don't have a Bart Ehrman of the Muslim world because the Muslim world doesn't allow that kind of critical scholarship. So there's a double standard going on there when Muslims are using Bart Ehrman in the West. All I'm doing is saying, look, you, 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 you use Bart Ehrman against us, but Bart Ehrman in no way would agree with you concerning the crucifixion and concerning even the resurrection, Bart Ehrman would agree that, that the early church believed in a resurrection. Um, so that's all I'm saying. Um, and the other thing as well, presuppositions do play a massive role. And we can have a debate like this, but um, very few historical books on the historical Jesus will go into methodology. They'll, they'll mention it a bit. I know that N.T. Wright mentions it a bit and others. But methodology has a massive impact. And I, said, I showed you in Surah 2 verse 1 uh, and uh, the other Surah that for a Muslim, they will look at the... Uh, when, he's, when my friend is talking about history, he's looking at it from an Islamic perspective. If we look at history, I, when I'm looking at history, I'm looking at it from a biblical perspective, but I'm willing to say, all right, I'll put the Bible aside. Let's also look at what the secular historians are saying. And the secular historians do agree with what I, what I would call, and this is important, the plausibility structure. Every theory, every fact has a plausibility structure. And a plausibility structure means that you will never have all the detail. You'll never have all the detail in history. You'll never have all the detail in science. There'll always be things that you never get accurate or you need to tweak. But if something is a fact or is a theory that's 70% that's correct, it will have a plausibility structure. And the Gospels and the New Testament have a plausibility structure that Jesus died and rose again. That plausibility structure is not undermined by any modern scholarship of any repute today. All that my friend has dealt with is the minutia stuff, which will take hours and hours to deal with. The grand narrative, the grand facts, my friend, you, they're unquestionably accepted by scholars today. And I've given you N.T. Wright, I've given you his book to go and read on Jesus and, and, and the Son of God. And that is the major work today on this topic. I finished. Thank you. Thanks, Pastor Jason. So um, I've got one hand raised. We'll take a question from this. Uh, so this is Ijaz, a Muslim. And then maybe both of you two can just have a little chat and then we can call it a day. So, Ijaz, do you want to go ahead? Uh, can I be heard? Yeah, loud and clear. Okay, hopefully if you guys hear dogs in the background, 
it's not my fault it's akil's fault so uh please forgive me for that <laughs> okay uh so uh pastor jason thank you very much for your contribution you did confuse me on a few things though right so as you were speaking in the beginning i think by the second minute and the fifth minute you made two comments which severely confused me the the first comment you made was that the gospel of sorry the second comment you made is that the uh, gospel of john is historically accurate because of the fishing vessels used during the time period and i think you also mentioned uh, john chapter 5 with the sheep skate so we have two problems here the first one being that if you go to john chapter 1 i think it's verse 48 let me just check really quickly it is verse 44 actually it says philip like andrew and peter was from the town of bethsaida uh Bethsaida was not a town at the time of the disciples or at the time of Jesus it actually became a town a couple of years later it was a village at the time of the disciples so whoever wrote this gospel is uh, historically inaccurate the second thing you said you made is that uh, um it mentions the sheep skate uh, there's a difference among scholarship here with the construction of the word Bethsaida or Be- uh, sorry uh in um John chapter 5 either it's the sheep's gate or the sheep's pool and Eusebius I think uses the sheep's pool so they've gotten the name wrong and not only that John chapter 5 verse 4 has an addition John chapter 3 has an addition with the uh, sick people there's like three different categories he adds and I believe uh, John chapter 5 verse 1 he even gets it wrong he says the pool I believe it refers, refers to the pool of Siloam but uh, uh, what we've learned from recent ha- uh, archaeology is uh, if you look at the Hermeneia series on John chapter 5 it actually mentions there there are two pools not one two pools at that one location at the time of Jesus and closer towards the end of the, towards the end of the first century so that's just the second point the first point you made was that the gospels are a first century document and peculiar enough you mentioned the papyrologist so uh, uh is that an inference you're making and why would you cite a papyrologist on papyri that we don't have from the first century you men you referenced papyrus on polycarp that's all good and well but here's the question for you are you appealing to the voltage projection of scholars which in that case would validate your use of papyrus on polycarp but if that is the case then you're arguing based on a hypothetical without evidence and as far as i'm aware we don't have any documentary evidence from any of them from within the first century in fact i think much of what we have from them is from eusebius and please do correct me on that didn't eusebius say it was okay to lie about the gospel uh, i believe he uses the word agato sudestai in his work preparatio evangelica book chapter 12 chapter number 31 so those are my three comments on john i got you on john chapter 1 the town and the village uh, the mistake with the sheep skate on the sheep spool um and i got your papyrus on polycarp and your citation of a papyrologist the question also applies to akil i want akil to respond if that's possible as well thank you guys okay well, can i go first on that one ah uh, yes the question is uh, free i didn't i didn't know i was debating two people one person's enough uh a question is a question not not a uh, not a debate statement with it um i refer to the book you can refer to the book craig l blomberg 59 confirmed historical probable facts of the gospel of john and if you go into there he compares it with uh, josephus and archaeology and he has over 59 facts you can go and read that and uh, we could go in to to that another time but you can go and read that book and see in my experience of being in theology and academic study for many many years uh, having a degree from uh, Nazarene Theological Seminary also being at uh, for uh, four years over at uh, at um, Luther King House and uh, one thing that you learn when people are dogmatic about historical information like that a uh, scholar saying all oh, the bible's wrong here the bible's wrong there uh, you you pretty find out fi- find out pretty quickly that a lot of what they're saying is actually conjecture and uh, i'm sure if we went into some of the articles behind some of this information that you're given a lot of it is actually conjecture uh secondly uh, on the papyri papyriologists 
Uh, all I was doing is just giving you uh, a collection of writing. You see, in these debates, people can give cheap shots. What I wanted to do in this debate is I want to build a relationship with you next year. So I've just rattled off a few books for people to go and read, and we can go and discuss those books. That's why I quoted those books. Uh, and that's why I quoted the papyriologist, not, not to make any specific claim about that papyriologist, but to say that that's a book that people might be interested to read concerning this issue. I've made a strong case about the, you, surely uh, you do not dispute Ijaz, uh, and my friend can answer this, but if you dispute, if you seriously dispute that the four gospels were written in the second century, then you're not only on the fringe of scholarship, you're on the fringe of the fringe of the fringe of the fringe of scholarship. My case was a strong case that the Gospels are in the, the uh, first century. Did you want me to answer, Jason? You said you wanted your friend to answer. Did you want me to answer or no? No, I'm not debating you, Hijaz. I'm okay, debating no. the friend. No, there. it's just the comment you made. You said you wanted your friend to answer. So I got I, confused on that. But, but Radosh, we'll be, me and you will be debating, God willing, in January. We can do, deal with it then. Thank you. Okay, Akhil, do you want to uh, just uh, add something to that? Uh, I mean, I think the point you guys made uh, is valid, and I think uh, Jason recognized that. Um, but I, I do want to say this. I think that um, the Muslims get attacked a lot because we, we you know, we examine uh, aspects of the Bible that may be sensitive to Christians to have to really look at and deal with. Um, these are, these are, if you're inviting us to something, we need to see something tangible um, and reliable to accept. And what I, what I done in the beginning of my opening statement is I try to bring um, some aspects of how the Muslims view historical documentation. I mean, there's a whole science of verification of information. And when we look at just what we have, even considering the four Gospels themselves, I mean, they, they, it's, it's appended, the idea of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, to many Christians, it's not a problem. But for Muslims, this is a big problem because you're saying that these people wrote it and there's no verification they wrote it. So if they're anonymous by almost consensus and you're adding a name, um, this is considered to be some type of deceit. And because of that, this can have the document, you know, saying be discarded completely. So when a Muslim approaches these things, and I mean, this is back to Jason's point about presuppositions. Uh, yeah, we do have a presupposition, and our presupposition is that when you tell me something, I need to be able to verify it. And I need to be able to verify it down to its source. And if I can't do that, it's problematic for me. But the Christians don't have a problem with accepting it on face value because you feel that you know, it's true or you can just believe in it. Um, this is not acceptable uh, for the Muslim position. So I think the points that Ijaz raised uh, are, well, uh, are very good points for us to look along these lines. We need to be able to verify everything that comes our way. And if we can't, uh, then this, this situation becomes uh, troublesome for us as Muslims. And unless you can um, bring us something that's substantial, not just um, like the idea of it's possible or plausible, but when you have multiple things that contradicts or lends uh, to rejecting it, then it's problematic for us. And you know, I hope that this clarifies at least our position as Muslims on why we react to some of the documentation that you have uh, the way that we do. Right, uh, th thanks for that, Akhil. Uh, we do have somebody who's been waiting patiently to ask a question. So Ali, do you wanna ask a question? Go ahead, Ali. Hello, assalamu alaikum. Am I, am I heard? Yes. Hello, thank you. Uh, thanks for both of uh, us, Jason and brother uh, Peel. Um, I, I can late, so I, my point will be uh, somehow uh, have been referred to in this topic. Uh, so forgive me if I referred to something already been debated. Uh, my question is, um, what do you say about the, of the whole narrative of crucifixion, the whole story, each episode of this story has been, has some contradiction between uh, uh, two or three of the gospels. Like for example, um, uh, who was carrying the cross uh, uh, in Matthew, it says, uh, 
uh, Simon uh, John says Jesus, uh, who was, uh, for example, how how was uh, Christ was captured? Uh, who was the yeah. the timing of the crucifixion? Uh, who what ring okay, was yeah. given to Jesus? Uh, Ali, Ali, I think we get we get the gist of your question. So basically, you're talking about the, the contradictions amongst the four gospels. Uh, in, in concerning the narratives around the resurrection and crucifixion. So I'll, I'll, I'll uh, pass it on to the speakers. Thanks, thanks for your question. And if you could just both just give us a quick one minute, and, because we've got two other questions to get through as well. So Jason, do you want to go first on that? Yeah, no, I'll refer you to Dale Allison, who uh, is a world authority on, on this topic. And uh, he, he talks about eyewitness material. And he says that uh, eyewitnesses get the, the big big idea of an event, but the, the minutiae detail, they, they can uh, not get it correct. So what we see here uh, in the minutiae detail, there are, there are differences, but it doesn't affect the major event, the major issue uh, of, of that Jesus died. That, that, those minor issues we can debate about. And clearing up those minor issues, there's some excellent article, Alleged Contradictions in the Gospels, by Dr. Timothy McGrew, uh, part one, part two. Dr. Timothy McGrew, Alleged Contradictions in the Gospels, part one and two. And also a great book to read if you're really interested in, in, in not just having cheap shots against the Bible, but really, really mature reading and, and thinking about it, is Poitras' uh, book, Inerrancy in the Gospels, uh, it's um, Vern Poitras, Inerrancy and the Gospels, uh, Inerrancy and the Gospel by Vern Poitras. You can get that book free PDF on John Frame's website, and it's a very scholarly book. And the, the, the last thing is history. When you look at history, different historians look at it from different perspectives. And that's what you're seeing in the four Gospels, that, that each Gospel has their own way of writing history, and no historian chooses all the facts. They always choose the bits that they want to put in. Any historian does that. So Mark's put in the bits that he wants to put in. Uh, Luke's put in his bit. John's put in it. And, and they're giving you four different camera views, different direction. So what seems to be a contradiction isn't a contradiction. It's just a different way of looking at it. You just have to take the time to study that and, and find out the details of why that's the case. Right. Akil, do you want to give us a quick minute on that? Uh, yes, on that, uh, uh, on his closing point, it's interesting that he would say that, like, for instance, the Gospels are written from everybody's perspective, because then he also he tried to quote in the Quran that there's contradictions about the creation, uh, how different forms of creation, when you look at, you know, um, that um, litany of verses of the Quran that describes the creation, it describes it from every particular um, 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 facet that creation comes about. Uh, so it's not detailed in one particular verse, but it's actually, you take all the verses together, it gives you a full picture of how man came about. So it's interesting that Jason would use that analogy and um, reasoning for his Bible, but don't lend the same criteria for the Quran. And w w the question that the brother asked, uh, it is a valid question, even though there may be some nitpicking in some of the details. But the thing is, when you read the Bible, intertextually there's a lot of intertextual um things in the bible that's problematic um and, and it, i mean that's just reality for instance um jason began with quoting paul but when you look at paul paul is in contention with someone and he's saying that if you are so easily fooled and you have him in galatians you have him in Second corinthians you have him in uh, these different uh, letters he's writing he's contending with someone that's preaching a different gospel from his after he went to them and preached him. Who is it that he's differing with? Who is it that's contending with him? Who is it that's believing something different from what he mentioned? He even had to confer to people that, look, um, you know, why are you now having doubts about Jesus being crucified? So, I mean, this is, he's arguing with someone at that time that's preaching something different from him. Why is that? Why is this not you know, made known and examined to see who it is, in fact, that's, that's preaching something, a gospel other than his? Um, this is very problematic. Again, Jesus' prophecy of the um, being killed and rising again. Why would Peter say this is nonsense? This is foolish talk. He didn't believe it. Why would doubtful Thomas need verification to believe this if Jesus prophesied his death and resurrection? 
I mean, if you're talking to people over and over and over again and telling them, I must die, and then I'm going to come back, when they see you, why are they so alarmed? Why do they think you're a ghost? Why are they afraid of you? Why do they think you're a gardener? Why are these events that's happening if they are ready to expect Jesus to come back? We're waiting for a second coming. They know to wait for that. But why not waiting for the resurrection as allegedly prophesied about in the Gospels? These are things that when you read it, it stands out clear and they're very problematic, at least for the Muslims anyway. Um, they're not small, minutiae details, but rather they're significant because it undermines the dominant narrative um, that you project to us. And because we have e other evidence, um, these intertextual um, evidence that we bring forth substantiates and validates our position. Well, on exactly right, Akil, I'm sorry. Yeah, we'll I'm have done. to cut you off there. Yeah, okay. Um, thanks for that. So, Mustafa, do you want to just uh, ask your question? Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, loud and clear. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, my question is to Jason. Now, Jason, I'm not as learned as you, so you can enlighten me on this. I want to give you a few. I'm going to start a few stuff that you mentioned regarding witnesses. Now, you said that how can we deny the witnesses? And you've given so many references from Mark, Matthew, so and so, so and so. Now, you specifically used the 500 witnesses from 1 Corinthians 15. I believe it was 1 Corinthians 15. Could you name me 25 of those witnesses? Actual names. Can you give me names? I know Paul says 500. Could you actually give me 25 names? If you can. If not, that's fine. You also said you have Talmudic evidence regarding the crucifixion. Now, I can give you Talmudic sources as well on how a crucifixion happened. So maybe we can compare the two together and we can see how your evidence matches with mine. Also, um, I, I, I want to get into um, the idea of this historical information. So let's, let's, let's do this quickly. The two high priests are mentioned together, namely Annas and Caiaphas. Annas is addressed as the high priest repeatedly in John 18, 15 to 22. And the same in the same passage in verse 24, Caiaphas is described as the high priest. This cannot be true, Jason, because the Old Testament, Josephus, Philo, and Rabionic material all agree that the position of the high priest can be occupied by one person only at one time. Furthermore, the eminent authority in the Jewish studies, Germa Vermis, and I don't know if you quoted him, I could have uh, uh, sworn I heard his, uh, you quote him, says that John's claim in John 11, 49 to 59, uh, 51, and John 18, 13, that the high priesthood went through an annual rotation is unhistorical. So um, I don't understand how you came to the fact, uh, idea that the event of the historical event of Jesus crucifixion and leading to it was uh, historical now another thing I want to quickly add as well the charges of Jesus when he uh, about his crucifixion uh, what was he charged for Jason for blasphemy according to your Bible it says he was to uh, a charge for blasphemy but according to the Misna the blasphemer is punished only if he utters the divine name the tetragrammaton that is Yahweh our Joshua Akaba said in Talmud Sanhedrin 55b, you will only be punished with capital punishment if you blaspheme the name of Yahweh. Did Jesus blaspheme the name of Yahweh? If he did, maybe you can show us from the Bible. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, so, uh, Jason, because it's probably getting a little bit one-sided here, um, and that was a lot of question questioning, just answer those questions. I won't let Akil respond to that and then we'll finish off with the last question um, from uh, uh, um, I think Abu Muhammad is waiting to ask a question so do you want to just qu quickly answer most of his questions okay yeah I I'm glad you cut it off a bit there I, th I think it's a bit unfair these aren't questions these are these are debate statements so it's a bit unfair a quick question what do you think of this what do you think of that but having like long statements like this by by Ijaz and Mustafa is not fair, all right? Uh, but because you've cut a bit thing, okay. But next time it happens, it's got to be a quick question, then I can reply. Not, not a number of points like this. I think on the issue of the high priest, 
CFAS and whatever. I think you need to do some more research, though. It's a while since I've studied it, but uh, I don't think uh, I think you're being a bit too dogmatic about Josephus and uh, the sources about uh, there can't be two high priests at the same time uh, about that. So I think you need to go and check that again. Um, you mentioned so many things there. I mean, I, I, I just, um, uh, I can just refer you to an excellent article on uh, on these topics uh, by a Christian think tank, and it's about contradictions and the resurrection. It's a very, very scholarly article when he goes into all the issues of contradictions in, in, in the historical record. But I think the main thing is, is to remember this, that in historical writing, um, Every historian, every historian chooses the material that they, they need. And that's very important. So uh, no historian will put everything in. For example, um, so to, uh, the Jews being expelled from, um, from Rome was not mentioned by most of the historians of the time, uh, in the time, in the 60s, 68, in the, 68, in the uh, first century, in the 60s. Not many historians mentioned it. But Luke mentions it, and Suetonius mentions it. So, in other words, when writers are right, when historic, the, the Muslims here, I'm afraid they're not. You, you're looking at it more polemically than actually academically. When when people when ancient writers are writing history, they don't put everything in. They only choose the bits that they want to put in, and that is for every writer, even in modern time. The other thing I want to say: there was something you said. Uh, concerning the eyewitnesses. Listen, if, Luke, if, if Paul was lying and Paul was saying the same things as the other disciples, contrary to the, my, my esteemed friend, Paul in uh, Galatians chapter 1 said he met Peter and James and they all agreed that Jesus died and rose again. There was no distinction between Paul and the disciples on that issue. Um, the, the point what I want to say is if Paul was lying, if the disciples were lying, if, if they were wrong, all the Romans had to do was to say, there's no such thing as 500 witnesses, you're all lying, here's the dead body. And then finally, if you notice these Muslims here today using all these critical arguments, they're getting all these arguments if we were to scratch from the surface from secular and, 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 and Christian writers who've been influenced by secular writers. But this kind of scholarship is not in the Muslim world. They, they don't have the same Bar Ehrman in the Muslim world. They're, 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 they're doing a double standard. But my friend here is saying that he's coming at this objectively and he wants to look at it objectively. But all this stuff that he's using to critique the Bible, he's getting it from secular writers. He's getting it from Christians who've been influenced by secular writers. It's, the Muslim world doesn't do this kind of scholarship. So all I'm saying is that I've given a good case, of his, uh, a scholarly case, for the reliability of the Gospels, a scholarly case for the reliability uh, of the sources. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, my, my esteemed friend has not engaged with any of the scholarship. He's just using popular arguments that are not actually dealing, he, he hasn't dealt with N.T. Wright, he's not dealt with uh, uh, Richard Balcom. And in fact, you know, unless you start dealing with these things, and it's no good saying, oh, we're criticizing, get into the detail of the Bible, no, you're coming at it from a Quranic perspective and you want to criticize the Bible. If you were really interested in scholarship, you would all say to me, actually, we've read N.T. Wright and this is our opinion against it. And you've not said that. So you're not really engaged in the scholarship. You're not really engaged. You can't just dismiss Josephus and Tacitus and say they got it from Christian. It's absolute nonsense. They got their sources independently. You read Josephus, you read uh, Tacitus. They got their documents from other sources, they didn't get them from the Christians. And that's independent witness to the Gospels being accurate and Paul being accurate. And then finally, on the Talmud and Mishnah, it clearly states in the Talmud and Mishnah that people were, that rabbis taught their people to memorize things word for word. And in 1 Corinthians 15, we have a creed there that goes right back to within two years of Jesus. Even Dominic, uh, James Dunn, one of the great scholars of our time would agree that that is historical material that Jesus died and rose again within two years of Jesus. Amazing. You're not engaging in the scholarship, guys. A lot of this is cheap shots, and we need to go deeper onto this topic. Okay, well, 
Um, if I can just quickly, so, uh, yeah, yeah, just yeah, yeah. Go, go ahead, Paul. Uh, <laughs> you I mean, gotta I, be really quick. You gotta I, be really I know, quick. because Jason is saying that we're taking chiefs out of the Bible, but he's taking chiefs out of me now. Like you know, like so. So um, quickly, I mean, like even some of the points uh, he's not even uh, addressing. Like some of the points he just mentioned, he's not even dealing with them. But I know, you know, um, the time is short. But quickly about um, the Muslim world doesn't have this kind of scholarship. Um, it's amazing, and uh, he's saying that, you know, we ha haven't dealt with his scholarship, but it's evident from statements like this that he has no idea of Islamic scholarship. He has no idea of Muslim books on writing whole biographies of every single person that's narrated in their job profession and who they were and where they were born, all these things. I mean, this scholarship came from the Muslims. This textual criticism came from the Muslims examining their men when it comes to Hadith and like that. So this is not new to the Islamic world. This comes from the Islamic world. When you examine the Hadith, it's examined, I mean, every aspect of it to from the person who collected it to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So when I say something that the Prophet said, I know with 100% certainty that he actually said it. And I can be sure of that. You have that, you don't have that assurance. We can debate this topic if you want, uh, Jason. We can debate, but we study Hadith science and the people of, of this, you know, this is scholarship. This scholarship you're talking about came from the Muslims. First and foremost, you have nothing like it to verify your sources. We have everything. I can give you a man's biography right now to how old he was, how many children he had when he traveled. You know nothing about the people who wrote the Gospels. You don't know who Matthew is or Mark is or Luke or John. You know nothing of them. Nothing. These are names that came later. You don't know who they are. What's their last name? Who, where they work at? Anything about them. We know everything about the people that narrated on Islam. So I want to just make that point, and I hope it's, it's, it's um, you know, is worth something for Jason. Okay, well, well, well you, you, you made your point well. I, I think he's getting quite heated, let's, so let's just uh, cool this down. Um, but j j just picking up on a few points that Pastor uh, Burns did make, um, Mustafa, the, the gentleman who listed, uh, I think, uh, too many questions, he should have just limited it to one or two. He is actually qualified, Jason. He studied with Christianity's best scholars on the crucifixion and resurrection. He's done a course with Michael Corner and uh, Dr. Patton as well. So you probably do want to uh, uh, do, do want to take that uh, comment back. Uh, but uh, I, I want to finish off with uh, Abu Muhammad. Uh, do you want to ask your question? And we will keep it to one question and one minute for each for each speaker, so we can just finish off. Yes. Yeah, go ahead, Abu Muhammad. Thanks for your patience. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. This question is for Jason. I wanted to ask you, do you consider the gospel as a historical eyewitness account or the words of God? If you consider it as a historical account, why do you, why do you call it as the word of God? Thank you, bro. That, that's a, that, I think that's, to me, that is the most uh, profound question of, and, and the most profound statement of tonight. And that's why I had my opening statement. I talked about presuppositions because my opponent and my esteemed uh, panel, next year we need to talk about it in much more detail. We have to be honest. I believe the Bible is the word of God. I said that right at the beginning. And the Muslims believe it's, the Bible is the word of God. And if we're going to have a, a real meaningful dialogue, we have to be intellectually honest that that plays a major role. I look at the Christian historical material from Christian glasses. My Muslim friend looks at it from green glasses. I look at it from red glasses. So yeah, for, 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 for the answer to that is the Bible is the word of God. It's my presupposition, and I'm not ashamed of that in dealing with historical evidence. But the Bible is not only a book of, as the word of God. It is rooted in history. I mean, I'll just give you an example, just, just, just for dialogue for next year. Just, just, just a dialogue. It's only a quick statement, but if you could just bear with me just for a second. Um, just, just, just bear with me for one second. Uh, because I, 
it's a very important question and I just want to bring something out. We'll get it, we'll get it, we'll get it, we'll get it, we'll get it. Just bear with me just for a minute. It'll be worth it. And you want some you need some up. Pastor Jason, do you want to just find that and let Akil speak whilst you're finding it? Yeah, yeah, if you could do that and then I'll come back. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thanks a lot. So should I answer the question or? Yeah, go for it. Okay, uh, I'm sure uh, it'll only take him a minute. Okay, yeah. So um, just quickly, um, it is a good question about the Bible being the word of God. And again, uh, Jason, I think that I don't know if it's just out of uh, maybe misinformation or uh, polemics. I don't know. But the Muslims don't believe that the Bible is the word of God without clarifying what that means. Uh, I would invite Jason to go to my website and read the article. I will on this issue. I just did a video on it. Um, but our position is that the Bible has truth from God in it, but it also has interpolation in it. Um, there's things that was added to it. And we believe this whole idea, um, this, this, this theology of crucifixion and resurrection is something that was added to it. We believe that from the very inception of the New Testament writings, it's a concoction of a doctrine that was fabricated upon Jesus. So you can have um, things in the historical, but it doesn't mean it's completely, you know what I'm saying, valid and reliable. And if you consider it to be the word of God only and that it's inspired, you have to deal with the contentions that's within the Bible. Um, you have to deal with the contradictions. You have to deal with these things. It can't be from God and it's filled with contradictions and inconsistencies. And Jason dealt with none of the things I mentioned about um, that raises a serious eyebrow. Uh, for instance, I mean, it's one of the biggest things to me. Why was Jesus hiding when he came back? Why did Mary think he was a gardener? Why did his disciples for a half a day after traveling with him didn't know they were talking to him, even eating with him? I mean, these are questions that are serious. How is this possible when, you, when you're telling us that this is God's word and these things are prophesied about? And, you know, these are questions that need to be answered. I mean, Jason didn't even go near them. Um, they're not small to us. They're, 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 they're very large because they undermine the authenticity of the story. We believe the story is a fabrication from inception. So just because it's historical and, and it, it's early, I mean, there's things today that people lie about and 100 years from now, 1,000 years from now, people will believe it as a lie. Doesn't mean it's true. It was a lie from the beginning, and it continues to be taught as a lie. We want to un, un, you know, um, un, un, clarify this matter for everybody. Now, are you ready with your quotation from your yeah, book? Yeah. And I, do you want I, to finish really, off with that? I, I, I really appreciate uh, my esteemed friend who, who just made the last statement there. I appreciate his passion, and I appreciate his sincerity. And all respect to you, sir. Thank you so much, Jason. Uh, likewise. Um, I, I mean that sincerely. You, you, you impress me as a very sincere man and a very honest man, and I appreciate that. Thank you, Jason. Uh, all, I, all I wanted to bring out, and maybe we could discuss it next year, is uh, in the Quran, Surah 9, 128, Surah 21, 108, Surah 33, 22, Surah 33, 41, Surah 3, 46, Surah 33, 47, Surah 35, 57, Surah 48, 29, Surah 68, 5. All I wanted to bring out, these are verses about Muhammad. And there's very little in those verses of historical information about Muhammad. And my question is, if we had the same criteria put upon those verses that my esteemed brother has asked me, would those verses stand up to scrutiny? You would have to go to Bacardi or others to try and get inf historical information about Muhammad. It would, the Quran would not be able to stand its own to verify its historical information about Muhammad. Second point is, it says, and, and I know my, I've looked at my esteemed uh, friend's debate on this issue of the Quran and the Bible. So I know what he would say when I give these verses, but in Surah 2, 87, it says we gave Moses the book in, uh, on the Psalm. It says in Surah 4, 1, 6, 3, to, to David, we gave the Psalms, uh, the gospel. He sent down the law, Moses, and the gospel. Notice the contrast between law and gospel. Law is a book. So why is it in the gospel a book? And then Surah 5, 46, we sent in the gospel. And my friend will say, well, but when it talks about the uh, God gave the, the angel, it wasn't a book. And uh, he'll also say that, that when it says word, it means decree. Uh, so it doesn't mean say that the, the, the Bible is a book, it was just a decree. 
So I know what his rejoinder would be, but I would say to any Muslim who's fairly going to study the Quran, that it clearly teaches that the Bible is the word of God. And I can't, for my life, I can't understand how any Muslim can attack the Bible in any shape or form. To me, it's a contradiction. And again, if we go to Bukhari 6, 61, 556, Bukhari uh, 6, 61, 513, Sanan Abu Dawi 3, 10, 15, uh, Bukhari volume 6, 61, 514, Bukhari 6, 61, 519. There's massive issues about uh, whether Muhammad can remember his own verses and about the historical reliability of uh, Islamic sources concerning history. Uh, it says uh, in uh, uh, 661, 513, Muhammad requested seven different ways uh, of versions of the site in the Quran. That's a, that's major. I have major problems with that kind of uh, historical information when I read Bukhari and Uthman burning the Quran. And then finally, uh, just one quick ta caveat, because we've heard a little bit about undermining the text of the Bible, but top top copy, Musafa, um, there are two sheets missing, the uh, Samar, the, the Samar uh, manuscript, uh, early mid 8th century, uh, the Tashkent, there are there's 95 percent, 94 percent of the Quran there. The Al Husseini Cairo manuscript, there are missing words there, and then the Paris. Yeah, Jason, I, I thought you were gonna be quoting. I'm, I'm finishing, brother. I'm Jason, finishing. Jason. Just, just, yeah. just, just be respectful, just for one second. Yeah, uh, no, I, I thought, I, I thought you were gonna be. Yeah, but ho hold on, hold on. I thought you were going to be quoting uh, a, a book for reference did, for uh, Abu Muhammad. No, what, what I was quoting there, I've finished now. What I was quoting there is there are verses missing in these ancient Quranic texts. So we have to do textual criticism. So we're not even got into the Quran's text and how that relates to history. You know, that's all I'm saying. All I'm saying there with the verses in the Quran about the Prophet Muhammad, there's nothing there of very historical value and if we use the same criteria critiquing the Quran about Muhammad on historical information looking at the sources in the hadiths and looking at the Quranic text there are major questions that we need to ask and I'm not so sure that the Quran would stand up to the same kind of critical scrutiny that the Muslims are putting on me today God bless you and just to say that I really respect this gentleman and you guys thank you so much Thank you. Yeah, uh, I, I, I just want to finish off. Akil, yeah. Akil, Akil, could you look? Be, uh, um, I d wanted to give Pastor Jason the yeah, uh, final say because yes. I thought he was going to be referencing a book. But uh, can you just respond to this? Because it seems like Pastor Jason's left all this hanging out uh, right at the last moment. If you could just respond about the Quran, um, the manuscripts, Prophet Muhammad forgetting verses. Uh, do, do you want to just briefly touch on that, and then we can? Yes, I could be saying, and Jason had the last word. He could, he could follow up as, as he wished, and then we, we could close on that. I'm glad I got a chance to say that. Um, okay, so first and foremost, um, the Quran is not about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So it's not looking to tell a biography about the life of Prophet Muhammad. So the Quran is about God. It's God's revelation to humanity to guide them back to God. Um, so this is what the Quran focus is. The Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, is a vehicle that God used to convey his message to humanity. So the Quran is not there to describe the whole life of Prophet Muhammad as something historical, unless there's some benefits in that. Um, and we see in some places that's the case. About the Quran, things being missing from different manuscripts, um, I want to say this quickly. Um, the Quran from its inception never was predicated upon written um, Mus'haf. The Mus'haf came later. The Quran from its inception is oral transmission. And it was put on the heart of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he gave it to his uh, Sahaba, his companions, and they recited it back. So we have what is called Mutawatiya, uh, which is a multiple um, transmission that it reached a level where it's almost impossible, not even almost, it is impossible for this to be a corruption or a lie. And it, the Quran is Mutawatiya transmitted. I can bring you my teacher and he can give you a narration of the Quran from very beginning to the very end, the entirety of it, letter for letter, word for word, the whole of it. And not only can he do that from memory, I had a teacher who wrote the Quran from memory three times, but he can give you who he got it from, who they got it from, 
where they got it from, in like a family tree transmission, unbroken, verifiable, all the way back to the Sahabas of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, back to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, back to the angel Jibreel, alayhi salam, back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have this. You have nothing of the such. So to say that this manuscripts that's through history is missing some, some, some manuscripts here and some pages here, that's to be understood. Paper did not survive history, but the heart survived history. And I can, you, I can take all of the manuscripts of the Quran and put them on a remote island somewhere and bring you hundreds of thousands of people who memorize the Quran by heart, and I can rewrite it word for word, and it would be the exact same Quran as those on the island. You cannot do that. This is a miracle of the Quran. We have this in our history. You don't have that. So it's, it's not fair to say, throw these things out there and the Prophet Muhammad forgot things, whatever it is. If he forgot something, someone automatically reminded him. I would invite you to a masjid and listen to a person who the Quran. If you make one little mistake of a letter, everybody behind him is correcting him. Why? Because of the emphasis to never make a mistake with the word of God. From the beginning, the Muslims understood the Quran is God's word and they never play with it. And they treat it as such. The Bible, the people who wrote it, they didn't know they were writing God's word. They thought they were writing history. It's a big difference. A big difference. He can, he can, Jason, I, I hope you can comment on that and have the last word. It's fine. And thank you for the, uh, um, the, the kind words and entertaining. But this is something, we, this is a miracle for the Muslims. No one has this. No one in history. Okay. We have, uh, you would agree that we have a, a Bakari hadith where Uthman burnt the text. If the chain of narration is true, what you're saying, just think about this. If the chain of narration is correct, then why was there a text in the first place? Why did he have to make the text? So, to, uh, let, me, let me answer quickly. So, first and foremost, the Prophet Muhammad peace upon him said, when you have no more use of something you write down for the Quran, to burn it. So from the very beginning, this is an instruction of the Prophet Muhammad so that the Quran itself, because it's considered to be holy, won't get to the hands of people who have no respect for it. And what Uthman burned were personal copies of people. There was only one official copy of the Quran that Uthman used and returned back to Hafsa, the daughter of Umar. So the other copies were personal copies that people wrote down the Quran. They wrote down their notes. It was to make sure that these things did not circulate into the population and people would begin to think they were the Quran. And the Prophet Muhammad said that when you had no use of the Quran, a personal note, burn it or discard it so it won't get into the hands of anybody else and they, dis they disrespect it. You got people today yeah. taking Qur'ans and burning them, peeing on them, mm -hmm. disrespecting the Qur'an. This is the reason why. So that people will not disrespect it. Not because there was some problem with it. Can, can, I, can I come in? Can I come in? Yes. A, a couple of things there. One is, I don't think you would agree with burning Qur'ans today. The, I would. It depends if, if, for your purpose. I would. Okay, and I, I, the more I get to know you, the more and more I'm liking you, bro. The, the, um... J J Jason, Jason, Akil, let, let's just because it's going off onto a different debate topic. You guys can uh, well, chat in private and arrange a debate debate well, topic yeah, later yeah. on. Can we just finish this? Just finish this last minute. I don't mind. Yeah, go on. This, this is good. This is healthy. It's, it's, I don't mind. Go finish. Go on, Jason. This is this is important because it it, it dovetails into the. It really is important because there's a clash between is Christian historiography and Islamic historiography, and this is this seems as if it's off topic, but it's not. The book it's very important to have how Christians look at sources and how Muslims look at historical sources, and and and, and, the, and so it's absolutely key and fundamental to the debate and discussion. It's not off topic. All I'm saying is that, that burning material. Um, that, that to me, uh, there's a question there about it. I know you've explained your position on that, but that gives me it, problems about looking at history when people are burning evidence. That's number one. Number two is your argument about chain of narration contradicts itself. Look at the logic. Chain of narration, we need it to pass on, but why do we need a text? We've got a text and chain of narration. So the fact that we have a text means it's not just chain of narration the two go together they're not separate so but but you have to look at history in order to understand the question jason what, what what was the reason to compile a text in the first place many of those people who have memorized the quran by heart when in battle they lost their lives so the the, the senior companion said listen if this continues like this 
we are afraid that the Quran will be lost because all of those who memorize it by heart are dying in war. So let's back it up with the written text just in case. But the written text was never relied upon. You cannot become a scholar of the Quran by reading the Quran. You have to take it from people who memorize the Quran by heart and pass it on word for word. There's a science called Tajweed, which is how we know how to recite the Quran, how we know how long to hold it, how long this, how long that. From over 1400 years, I know exactly how the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu recite the Quran down to a vowel extension. This is an amazing thing. This is a miracle. That I know when he said, Walla Bolin, there's six harakats. How do I know that? Because it's been successfully and truthfully passed down over 1400 years, letter by letter. Who can say that in history? Anybody. We don't need any manuscripts. We have people who memorize the Quran by heart and they live hundreds of thousands on this earth and can write the whole Quran out by memory. We don't need manuscripts. Manuscripts have survived and some have not. The Muslims have been slaughtered to the point where their libraries was, just, just was burned and thrown in the river. Read the history of the Tartars where they say that the, 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 the river went black with ink and then after went red with the blood of the Muslims. We lost many manuscripts, but we still have those who memorize the Quran by heart and we can always reproduce our sources from memory. No one can say that. Well, there's a lot I would like to say. But out of respect, I'm going to leave it there and let you you have that final word, yeah? I, I could come back to you and say quite a lot. Of, uh, I'd like to say a lot. But I think uh, out of respect to you, and, um, you know, I hope this is a, a, a basis to maybe explore things in a deeper way next year. And maybe we could go into this and other topics, you know? So thank you very much for being patient with me. And thank you for your time. Thank and, you, Jason. Uh, I really appreciate it. And if you can give me any links of information, I'd value you, uh, you send me in information and I'd like no, to read up more. I will, I will get your contact and we can share stuff offside, but I really appreciate it. Thanks so much and I appreciate the, um, the comments and I look forward to it because these things are important. You're right. And um, I apologize, Yahya, for going on, but I think this is important to clarify these things and, and I hope people benefited from it. And uh, my respect to you, Jason, very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Yahya, for the patience and for the hosting. Yeah, so if you can all uh, just stop recording and people can hang about, have discussions, etc. Um, but for the debate, that's it. So.